So now we are ready to go. So it's a pleasure to welcome you back from your coffee. And we will have Anne Spearing telling us about integrability and chaos in supersymmetric theories from anomalous dimension spectra. Yeah, and I will you. interrupt you 10 and five minutes before the end. That's great. So thank you. Yeah, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for hosting, virtually hosting this night's nice conference and inviting me to speak here. And so this talk is about a project that I've been doing together with Tristan McLaughlin and Dal Pereira, and it is about anomalous dimensions in superangle theories. So these anomalous dimensions will really play the main character in my talk, and I'll discuss how statistical properties of large sets of anomalous dimensions can help us understand the underlying theory. In particular, we will find integrability and chaos in these objects. And so this work kind of comes in the context of a quest to understand universal properties of young Mills theories, and in particular, universal properties in the statistical behavior of its observables, like the energy or mass spectrum. And here I'll discuss conformal field theories, and conformal theories don't have energies or masses, but there's kind of a hidden spectral problem. The dilatation operator is a symmetry generator in these theories, and so its eigenvalues to scaling dimensions form kind of a CFT analog of a spectrum that can be used to characterize operators. And so the dilatation operator, D, um, on the space of local operators, O, acts like this. So we have the classical scaling dimension that just um, is kind of an engineering dimension, the di mass dimension of the operators. And the anomalous dimensions are then the corrections to this. And so we get the one, we can get the one loop anomalous dimensions from diagonalizing the, the one loop dilatation operator on the set of operators that we are interested in. And this dilatation operator is actually very closely related to scattering amplitudes. And I'll discuss this connection a bit later in the talk. In this first part, I, I will not mention amplitudes a lot, but then halfway through, I'll discuss an on-shell approach that really makes apparent that the universal, universal structures that we find in anomalous dimensions are somehow connected to structures and amplitudes. Um, but yeah, before getting there, I'll discuss a bit more of those anomalous dimensions and the dilatation operator. In N equals four to bang Mills theory, the dilatation operator is known, and in the scalar SU2 sector, it has a particularly simple form. So let me just quickly remind you, N equals four contains gluons, fermions, and scalars. There are six real scalars, and the scalar SU2 sector is spanned by two complex linear combinations of these, which I'll denote by X and Z. And then in this sector, we would be interested in local operators and local gauge invariant operators. So we would take those X's and Z's and put them into traces. And I can form single trace operators, and I can also form multi trace operators just by taking products of traces. And let me also mention here that we looked at n equals 4 with gauge group SUN. And now associated to each of those operators I can build is an, a scaling dimension and an anomalous dimension. And I can get those dimensions from the dilatation operator, which in the SU2 sector of n equals 4 has this form. So this first term is just the tree level dilatation operator that um, gives you the classical scaling dimensions. So it contains the two um, scalars, X and Z, that span the scalar SU2 sector. And then it also contains those functional derivatives, X check and Z check. And they um, kind of act on the Xs and Zs by annihilating mm -hmm. them. And so in this combination here, um, this operator, if I would act on, for example, this thing here, then would pick me out the x's, the x check would, um, would annihilate the x's, and then in this combination, they would just directly get replaced by the x. And so this kind of counts the number of x's in an operator. This counts the number of z's in an operator. And so this gives me the length of an operator in the SO2 sector, which for a purely scalar operator is just the classical scaling dimension. And then at one loop order, um, the dilatation operator looks like this. It contains um, now a product of those functional derivatives. And when taking this operator and acting on a general, um, general local operator, this can really change the structure of the operator. So if I take it and act on a general single trace operator, I, I can get back single traces, but maybe with different orderings of the x's and z's in the trace, but I can also get back double trace operators. 
And so the, then the question is, how can we diagonalize this mixing to extract the anomalous dimensions? And um, well, for very short operators to can actually do this quite quickly by hand, but as the operators get longer and longer, the mixing matrix gets bigger and bigger and it becomes um, very hard to obtain the dimensions. And so this kind of cries for a more general approach. And in the planar limit, this is achieved. We know that the one loop dilatation operator maps to the Heisenberg spin chain Hamiltonian. And so we can use integrability techniques um, to, to solve this diagonalization. The one loop anomalous dimensions just become energies of the spin chain. And integrability is a powerful tool. Uh, for example, the cusp anomalous dimension of planar n equals four at any value of the coupling was obtained using integrability. And um, also through the Pentagon OPE framework, integrability gives a, a non perturbative description of scattering amplitudes. And this is an important input for the hexagon function bootstrap. But this is in the planar limit. At finite n, we don't quite know how to solve this um, mixing in the general case. Here, there are certain very impressive um, results for specific operators. Um, in particular, the twist two operator at four loops was studied to um, extract the, the for loop non-planar cusp anomalous dimension. But in the very general case, we don't know how to diagonalize this mixing. Um, but what we can always do is kind of take this dilatation operator, act on the operators, as long as they're not too long, we just act on the operators, find the mixing matrix, and then do a direct diagonalization. And if you do this, and um, kind of do this on a big enough set of operators, then you just get the anomalous dimensions as kind of, you get just a huge list of anomalous dimensions, a huge list of numbers. And then the question is, can we actually learn something from these numbers? Can they help us understand the underlying theory that we can't really get a handle of analytically just yet? And to kind of approach an answer to this question of what can we learn from such a spectrum of anomalous dimension, um, I'll discuss it a bit more broadly because this is actually a very, very old question. What can we learn from spectra, both the underlying theory? And for this, I have three spectra here. The first one is um, just the spectrum of the harmonic oscillator. So all the energy levels are just evenly distributed. At the opposite end, I have kind of the opposite spectrum here. I just picked levels randomly from a certain, from a given interval. So in all of these examples, the mean level spacing is the same, but if I just pick random um, energy levels, then they can be quite far, but they can also be arbitrarily close, like here and here. Levels are almost on top of each other. And such a spectrum you find, for example, from the, from the Heisenberg spin chain. And then I have a third spectrum here in the middle, and this I just obtained by diagonalizing a random matrix. And in random matrix theory, you can look at um, lots of ensembles, and a particular important ensemble in physics is the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, the ensemble of all um, real symmetric random matrices. And so this, um, this spectrum I obtained just by diagonalizing a real symmetric random matrix, and um, it's kind of, yeah, in the middle of the states are the levels are maybe not as regular as here, but they also don't want to get as far as there. And yeah, as I said, this, this um, ensemble is very important in physics already in the 50s. Wigner realized that the spectrum of heavy nuclei resembles the spectrum that you find in matrices of this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And this realization then initiated the whole development of random matrix theory, and people realized that lots of physical spectra are described by random matrix theory. And actually they realized that it is quantum models that have those spectra that in the whose classical limits are classically chaotic. So there seems to be a universal, universal feature of quantum chaotic models in that their spectra can be described by random matrix theory. And so this then led to the conjecture by Buidas, Giannoni and Schmidt that quantum chaotic models have spectra that can be described by random matrix theory. And then over the years, lacking a good definition of quantum chaos, the statement was also turned around and is now often used in this direction. If I have a quantum system and the spectrum can be described by random matrix theory, then this defines it to be a quantum chaotic model. And this is also the direction that I'll use it in for this talk. And similarly, people also realize that those uncorrelated spectra, they appear for integrable models. 
And this is the content of this very table conjecture. And so there are things that we can learn from general spectra. All these examples have different correlations and they tell us something about the underlying model. And so this was kind of the idea um, for this project. We look at anomalous dimension spectra and N equals four and see what comes out. What can we learn for, about N equals four? And um, well, we studied spectra in N equals four, but we also looked at spectra in a slightly deformed version of N equals four, the beta deformed theory. And this kind of has a rather technical reason um, because if you compute anomalous dimension spectra in N equals four and then look at correlations, then if you are not careful, the only thing that you see is all the symmetries that N equals four has, and there are so many symmetries. And then you have to go to subsectors of the theory um, to do the, to do the analysis, analysis there, and then the statistics become poorer. And so for such a statistical analysis, it's actually um, more, more useful to have a theory that has fewer symmetries. And one example of this is the beta deformed um, N equals four super remote theory. And although this theory itself is also an interesting generalization of N equals four. Um, and so I'll kind of make a little detour now to the beta deformed theory um, and then come back to the anomalous dimension spectrum. And so beta deformed N equals or pure N equals four super null theories um, contained in this larger class of supersymmetric conformal field theories. Um, beta deformed theory is probably the most prominent example and its planar limit is just as integrable as um, and pure N equals four and the planar dilatation operator is known. And it was also studied in the context of the ADS CFT correspondence and the gravity tool was found by a TST deformation. And also amplitudes were studied in this theory and in particular the planar amplitudes are remarkably simple. The partial um, planar amplitudes are just given by the undeformed up amplitudes up to a phase vector. And this phase vector depends on the Cartan charges of the SU4 R symmetry of the N equals four supersymmetry. And this then really makes the breaking of the N equals four supersymmetry to N equals one supersymmetry manifest also in the amplitudes. And they were also studied at the non-planar level in this paper at tree level, um, one loop and also partially at two loop level. And already at tree loop, uh, sorry, already at tree level, what is interesting is that there occur double trace contributions um, due to double trace interaction terms in the deformed Lagrangian. But at four loops, actually, it's not too hard to um, bring the tree level amplitudes in a form that looks very similar to the undeformed amplitudes. And so I have a simple example here of a purely scalar amplitude in the deformed theory. So these were the fields in the SU2 sector. And this looks very similar to just a color dressed um, Park Taylor amplitude, or super Park Taylor amplitude. Only here, um, I have two deformed structure constants. And these deformed structure constants um, are defined up here. So um, they have this G tilde beta in the front and G tilde beta is the ratio of G beta and the young Mills coupling. And this G beta is kind of a new coupling constant that appears in the beta deformed theory, in particular in front of this double trace, new double trace term in the, in the deformed theory. And then in the trace, I also have a beta deformed commutator and it's just defined as the usual commutator, but with two phase factors sitting in front of the two terms. Um, so yeah, so we have um, kind of the amplitudes and now in this theory, we're also interested in the anomalous dimension spectrum. And for this, we need the, um, the dilatation operator at finite n. And um, there are a few approaches to obtain dilatation operators. And one particularly efficient way is via this on-shell method um, from this paper by Carol Nord and Wilhelm. And it's based on this um, kind of curious relationship between the dilatation operator and scattering amplitudes. And um, so here is the one loop dilatation operator here sits the amplitude. And so this relation kind of then makes it apparent that by studying the properties of the dilatation operator or the anomalous dimensions, we are really also probing properties of the amplitude. But let me kind of um, go through this um, relation um, 
yeah, really slowly. So on the left hand side, we have the one loop dilatation operator, and in particular, the component that mixes an operator OA into an operator OB. So this thing is the overlap of an end particle on shell state with the off shell state created by the action of the operator OB on the vacuum. So kind of pictorially, it looks like this, and there's a form factor. And this form factor is evaluated at tree level. And for a tree level form factor to be non vanishing, the field content in the, in the external state has to correspond to the field content in the operator. So this is the left hand side. Then on the right hand side, there are two terms. The second term, again, contains a minimal form factor of um, the, the operator OA, and it multiplies an infinite divergent factor. And this term cancels infinite divergencies um, from this convolution term, which is kind of a, the one loop unitarity cut of the form factor of the operator OA. So you have um, kind of a tree level form factor of the operator OA and the, the amplitude, and I'm integrating over all on-shell momenta running in the cut and also some of all flavor combinations. And so this really, yeah, you can really extract the, the dilatation operator in some sense from, from the amplitude by realizing what particles I can put here in the external state. This really, without this vanishing, this really determines for me the mixing of the dilatation operator. And just to make this, um, even a bit more apparent, I'll, yeah. And Sorry, just no. 10 minutes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, I'll just quickly um, do this calculation for the, for the undeformed amplitudes. So um, in the scalar SO2 sector, this operator or A would only contain X's and Z's. And so for example, I can have an X here and a Z here. And then for the amplitude, I have another set of X's and Z's here. That would just be kind of the usual color dressed Park Taylor amplitude. Um, and now you really have to kind of sit down and do the calculation. But this T channel diagram more or less gives rise to divergencies that cancel against these terms. And this gives the finite term that becomes the dilatation operator. And if you, if you really do the calculation, then you can extract the one loop dilatation operator in, the, in, the, in n equals four and you get this. And so really the one loop dilatation operator comes, comes directly from the amplitudes. And you can do the similar calculation in the deformed theory. There you just have those deformed con structure constants. This term is unchanged, again cancels against the infrared divergencies. And um, those deformed structure constants, they the one interesting thing that maybe I can quickly go back. If you take those deformed structure constants and plug them in here and do then the, the color contractions in the index E, then due to the deformation in the, in the commutator, you not only get single trace terms, but also double trace terms. And so already at tree level, there are single and double trace terms. And this, this information gets kind of propagated also to the, to the dilatation operator. And again, you find a single trace term, which is kind of the one inherited from the undeformed theory. And we now we have the, the deformed commutators. And then there is also a double trace term, really a generically new term in the, in the dilatation operator. Okay, so now we have the dilatation operators. And um, well, you can compute um, anomalous dimension from them kind of by hand if the operators are short, maybe to be a bit more efficient, you plug it into, for example, Mathematica, and then you can compute um, anomalous dimensions of your favorite operators. And then what can we do? What can we do kind of with those spectra of anomalous dimensions? And there's a few things you have to do before you can actually look at the correlations. But then once you're done with this, um, what you can do is the nearest neighbor spacing distribution. You can look at the nearest neighbor spacing distribution. And for this, you just kind of take your, your spectrum, then you compute the spacings between the nearest neighbor levels. I will denote them by, by little s. And then, well, what could be the result of such an analysis? If I, again, have the spectrum of the harmonic oscillator, there, all the levels are just evenly, evenly spaced. And if I normalize the spectrum, then all the levels um, will be spaced by one. And then I get in the distribution just kind of the, the Dirac delta around a spacing of one. For the uncorrelated spectrum, where like yeah, the, all the levels are completely uncorrelated, 
There I get um, the Poisson distribution for the spacing distribution. And then the three other curves I have here, they correspond to different ensembles in random matrix theory. Maybe since I think I'm running a bit out of time, I'll just discuss this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble that I already mentioned earlier. So these are all the random matrices that are invariant under orthogonal transformations, or the real symmetric ones. And um, the spacing distribution for, for those corresponds to, to this yellowish curve. And so again, conjecturally, this Poisson um, distribution appears for spectra and integrable systems. Whereas the two or the, the different um, different random matrix theory ensembles, they correspond to different versions of quantum chaos. And so now, um, what is the result for for n equals four or the beta deform theory first? Um, and five minutes. Mm -hmm, great. Yeah. So here I have two um, two kind of the results for two spectra and the deform theory. Um, this first one is for length 17 operators with eight X's and the rest are Z's in the planar limit. And the, the red dots, they correspond to the spacing distribution we find. And they follow, the red dots follow this Poisson distribution quite nicely. And so we can really see the, the planar integrability in the spectrum of anomalous dimensions here. Then as we go to spectra in the finite theory, we again compute the nearest neighbor spacing distribution in the, in the same sector. And now the spectrum doesn't look Poissonian anymore. Now the spectrum kind of yeah, the, the spacings follow the, the random matrix theory prediction. And so this points towards the quantum chaotic nature of the underlying theory. And in particular, this distribution corresponds to this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And then we did a similar analysis in the undeformed theory. Um, here I have a plot from the SU2 sector. We also looked at the SL2 sector and we find similar results. The nearest neighbor spacing distributions follow this, um, follow the GOE prediction. And so from the anomalous dimensions and their nearest neighbor spacings, we can really see the, in the planar spectrum, we can see the integrability and then as we go to finite and we find chaos and the but there's still some structure we can describe the spectra by random matrix theory and okay so then let me just um, quickly wrap up so i discussed short range um, correlations and anomalous dimension spectra and we've seen that we can really see the planar integrability of the theory from those spectra and then going to finite and we find chaos and um, I show, I've shown you the results from, from like short range correlations. We also looked at long range correlations. And then we also looked at the, like if you have the mixing matrix, you can compute the eigenvalues, but you can also look at the eigenvectors. And you can also do a statistical analysis of these by um, computing the information entropy. And random matrix theory also makes prediction for, predictions for this. And there again, we find that the non-planar eigenvectors are described by random matrix theory. And so this um, leads us to the conjecture that n equals four and its beta deformed version are chaotic at finite and described by this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And I think this feature of non-planar n equals four is quite remarkable. So despite this theory being so kind of incredibly unphysical with all the symmetries, the conformal symmetry, the supersymmetry, the spectrum looks incredibly generic. Also the spectrum of physical theories um, like the spectrum of, of heavy nuclei looks like this. And then, um, yeah, maybe to be a bit quicker, to, as, I, as I said earlier, the anomalous dimensions, with the anomalous dimensions, we are kind of probing also scattering amplitudes of the theories and making this a bit more direct would be interesting. And actually there's already some work on the connection of the S matrix and chaos. In a paper from last year, Rosenhaus um, proposed a probe of quantum chaos directly on the basis of the S matrix in terms of erratic behavior. And um, this was then also used in, in the study of a certain string theory amplitude and indeed signs of chaos were found. And I think somehow studying this connection of scattering amplitudes and chaos further, understanding what consequences this random matrix theory behavior 
um, that we find in the anomalous dimension spectra has on the level of the amplitude could be really interesting and reveal how much you know, physics really is hidden in amplitudes. But okay, thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. And uh, let's give Anna an applause. So we have uh, about five minutes for some questions and then we rush on with the Tibur's talk. But uh, do we have some questions for Anne? I see two hands. Shall I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Anna. Nice, very fascinating Hi. talk. What can, what can you say about the transition between integrability and chaos? In other words, you know, how large does n have to be? And does it depend on exactly which sets of operators you're looking at? Um, well, we mainly looked at this only in the, uh, I think the transition sorry. we only looked at in the SU2 sector. And it's a bit yeah. hard to really say anything from kind of statistics, but yeah, here we kind of try to, to look at the transition a bit. And it's actually quite remarkable. We don't have to go to too high ends to, to almost see this, the, the Poisson behavior, yeah. But to, yeah, it would be nice to have an, like an analytic handle really for this. Um, to I see guess I'm wondering exactly if, that, if that transition depends on which class of operators you're looking at or if it, it might happen in a different place Anyway, that that's excellent to mm -hmm. see uh, see where it happens there. Yeah, thanks for that plot. I mean, it's one thing I can say maybe is that it depends. Um, I mean, we look at kind of different lengths of the operators and look at different yeah, sectors of the theory. And I think with with like growing sectors, the also the rank of the gauge group where the, the it kind of switches over from Wigner Dyson to Poisson also gets bigger. But we haven't um, we haven't like really figured out what exactly this, this transition is looking like. Yeah. Great, thanks. I think there's also a question from uh, Omar. Uh, yes, uh, hi. Uh, thank you for the. Great talk. Um, I was wondering if any of your results depended on the value of beta or uh, what I have in mind is this um, imaginary beta taken to infinity limit uh, of this theory. Um, so does anything depend on what uh, beta is? Um, Whether there's chaos or not? In part. Mm -hmm. Well, this is for especially an interesting question in the in the planar limit, and I mean I think in the SU two sector it's independent of the SU, I think the SU two sector of the beta deform theory in the planar limit is always integrable for real and complex beta. But then we also looked at the SU three sector, and there you could really see how um, it's only integrable when beta is real and becomes chaotic when it's when it's getting complex. Yeah. Right, there's also work by Robert Demelo and collaborators, I think. Um, they consider the gamma deformed young mills and strong deformation limit, and they found chaos uh, there as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, be interesting to see how it's related. How it's related. Thanks. Okay. Are there any further questions? Otherwise, we can maybe go ahead with setting up next talk. Let's give Anna an applause.